Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to a Climate Wise Communities workshop. Today's uh, theme of the workshop is going to be rain, hail and blackouts. Something which I'm sure everyone's a little bit familiar with, um, at least the rain part of it, uh, since, the, since we've had quite a significant amount of rain in the past few weeks. So um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land which we meet today. I'd like to also pay my respects to the elders past and present. So joining us today is um, uh, Dr. Jenny Scott. She is the uh, Karingai Council's Sustainability Program Leader, and she'll be leading most of the workshop today. Uh, my name is James Chan. I am the Sustainability Project Officer, and we both work on the Climate Wise Community Program, which covers uh, not just storms, but also bushfires as well. So um, the flow of tonight's workshop will be fairly straightforward. We will do a presentation about the historical storms in the Karinka area. And then we will switch over to show you at least three different storms that have hit the North Shore area that are illustrative of the, of the storms that we do get. Uh, we'll be doing a hail storm, then we'll be doing a microburst, and then we'll then covering off on East Coast Low. And um, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, if you have questions for, uh, for Dr. Jenny, uh, Scott and myself, please put those questions into the Q&A box. That should be somewhere either on the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen. If you have any technical issues, uh, please put those uh, questions into the chat box and I'll do my best to get to you. Um, and yes, I think without further delay, we'll, we can get we'll, we'll get stuck into it. So over to you, uh, Jenny. Okay, well, thanks, James, for that introduction. So what we're going to go through tonight, uh, just as by way of a, a short synopsis, is we're going to look at the history of some of the storms that have impacted the local area of Karinga. And then we're going to look at some of the um, more, in, drill down into some more detail about some of the storms. Now, one of them will be a microburst, one of them will be an east coast blow, and the other one will be a hailstorm. And we'll look at some of the characteristics of those storms and the types of impact that they caused. We'll also be walking you through the Climate Wise Communities website, which will show you exactly what you can do to not only prepare in the short term, but in the longer term for these kinds of events. So the sorts of things that we'll be showing you is how you can um, increase the resilience of your property to uh, extreme weather events. And you'll see on the Climate Wise Communities website <clears throat> that we don't just look at storms, we also look at bushfire and heat and drought, because often things that you might do exclusively for storm or for bushfire, uh, also have benefits across those other two disaster types. So that's why we tend to take that broader view of looking at all the different extreme weather events and uh, see what we can do to our properties to reduce the impact of those. Okay, so James, can we fire up the presentation? So we have uh, Dick Whitaker to thank for these um, images and uh, a lot of the content of this historical storms presentation. He uh, was, a, well, he still is a meteorologist, but he was a meteorologist with the Weather Channel. And some of you may uh, uh, recognize his name. And uh, he put this together for the local area because that's where he lives. And obviously his passion is uh, anything meteorological. So just looking at these historical storms, if we can move on, we go through back to 1896. And that's one of the earliest ones that Dick found some detail of uh, for the Karingai area. Now, a lot of this comes from old newspaper reports uh, rather than any records that council had. Because strangely enough, it wasn't until probably the last 20 years, the council started keeping more detailed records about the impacts of these storms. So this particular storm happened on the 17th of November, 1896. As you can see, hail piled up seven feet at Taramara, 
So it was a, a pretty intense hailstorm. Uh, gardens and glass houses smashed. Of course, in those days, it was a predominantly rural area. So tiles and windows smashed around Paramurra, which was where the focus of the storm was. And local orchards stripped of fruit and foliage, roof slates smashed, and hailstones perforating corrugated iron verandas at Pimble. And uh, there down the bottom there, you can see that uh, uh, Dix included a, an excerpt from the newspaper, and it was from Carlingford to Taramara that the storm impacted. Um, and it says, undoubtedly received the fullest force of the storm. So other areas were impacted, but those areas seem to have been uh, the most affected. So that was the 1896 storm. And this is the path of that storm that Dick has drawn out. And you can see it coming from roughly from the west, the area that it impacted. And uh, it was uh, substantially a hailstorm. So it would have been probably in front of a cool change. And we would have seen very tall cumulonimbus clouds. And often when you see that greenish tinge to a cloud, that's when you get the hail. So if you see uh, very tall clouds with a greenish tinge to them, you know you need to have to hunker down for hail. So moving on, the next one that Dick looked at was the 1906 storm, and it actually was classified as a tornado. Now, surprisingly, uh, the North Shore has seen several tornadic events over the years, and they're not all that rare. And the tornadoes are characterized by little pockets of destruction. So the tornadoes move on a path, and you'll see in a second when we show you the path that Dick has drawn, uh, down uh, a corridor, and it will touch down and then go up, and the tornado touches down and goes up. So you see these pockets of destruction following a rough path, usually from uh, west to east, um, often from northwest towards the southeast. So moving on, this is just some detail of that storm, a um, little bit small and a little bit long to read, but he's underlined that uh, Shirley Street in Lane Cove was uh, probably one of the worst hit areas, as well as uh, Chandler Street in North Sydney and uh, St Leonard's. So it also um, impacted um, Karingai, but the worst of it was down towards the North Shore, then, the lower North Shore. Okay, moving on, some more reporting of the 1906. And uh, you can see that what happens often in, in tornadoes is buildings do get completely demolished. And um, the winds can, as we'll see a little bit later on, uh, go well in excess of 200 kilometres an hour. And um, panic among residents, well, that's what we're planning not to do. So hopefully, once you've been through this, <clears throat> you won't need to panic. You'll know exactly what to do. Okay, moving on. And just some photographs of that particular event. Of course, in those days, it was uh, photography isn't what it is these days. But largely, it does show you the amount of destruction that occurred around the local area. So moving on. Um, so Dick was saying that the equivalent of the damage done by this particular event was that of an EF3 tornado. So that's winds from 219 kilometres an hour to 266 kilometres per hour. So they're, in, in my living memory anyway, I can't remember a storm that has had wind velocities that high. Um, some of you may remember the 1991 storm. That was a different kind of storm again. It wasn't tornado, but um, we'll come to that shortly. Moving on, that's the path that it roughly followed. And those black dots are where it touched down. So you can see that there were those little pockets of destruction. In between would have had uh, some destruction as well, but not nearly as much as where this tornado actually touched down. So that's a, a really strong characteristic of a tornado. 
Okay, moving on. So up to 1991. So this was a downburst, a slightly different beast in terms of storms, where you get a sudden massive downdraft of air and it hits the ground and then radiates out to the side. And we have a, a, an artist's image of that kind of a, uh, an event. But uh, these are characterised by certain ways in which the trees are sheared off a few metres above the ground and um, they're widespread damage. We've also got a video of a downburst that occurred um, only about three years ago. So moving along, this is the path that that particular 1991 storm took. So it uh, was a fairly wide path of destruction, as you can see, but it has, like the other storms we've shown you, roughly followed the uh, Pacific Highway. Sometimes the storms veer off and go out towards Broken Bay, but uh, in this particular instance, and, and, and quite often, we see them traveling down that rough uh, corridor uh, down the Pacific Highway. Moving on, this is the kind of destruction that um, no doubt will be a living memory of some of you that happened, and that I think is in Taramara, the particular shot on the lower right. And there was so much timber for council to, to dispose of that they filled up uh, playing fields and part of the golf course. And I believe it took about three years for it to be finally processed and cleared away. So a uh, massive amount of tree damage. So Dick's just showing there the, the comparative paths that each of those storms took. And you can see there is some commonality. So it's interesting, we tend to see the tornadoes coming a little bit more from the north and the um, hail storms and the downbursts tend to come from the west southwest areas. Okay, moving on. So he says seven destructive storm, thunderstorms with loss of life and major widespread property damage since 1871. I suspect we could add to that since he uh, last um, did this. I think this is probably about 10 years old. And uh, by his calculations, I can expect a destructive storm in the northern suburbs once every 11 years um, and in Karinga about once every 20 years. Now that's based on historic averages. And of course, as we know, the climate is changing. And so those historic averages are really no indicator of future impacts. With the warming climate, there's more energy in the atmosphere and as a result, it can hold more moisture and the storms are more severe as we've witnessed over the last uh, probably two years. I mean, what's happened in the last two years has been record breaking in many different ways, but it was all quite predicted even 20 years ago by the climate scientists. They were saying these are the types of events we can expect to see and they did say somewhere between 20 and 25 was when we could see this sort of weather ramp up. So they're pretty much right on the money with the, that estimation. So moving on, we'll look at a hailstorm in a little bit more uh, detail here. Now, as I mentioned about that uh, green cloud, you can see that greenish glow inside that cloud. And uh, that's the one that we're told uh, indicates that uh, there's hail uh, forming in those clouds in the upper atmosphere. Moving on. <clears throat> so the hailstones, they're, they're interesting when they form. Some of them get bigger and bigger because they start to drop. And then because of the strength of the convection of the air going upwards, they go up again. And they might go up three, four times. And each time they go up, they can get bigger, more water uh, freezes around the core of the hailstone. And those ones that are spiky like that 
are the ones that have been very high up in the atmosphere and the um, spikes have formed on the outside of the hailstone. So you can imagine the velocity at which these things fall at and uh, the impact they make when they hit the ground. So just moving on. So James has got a, uh, an, a post hailstorm video to show us. James, would you like to explain what this is? Sure. Um, this uh, this was this is in fact my roof uh, prior to the renovation that I did as a result of the hailstorm. So this uh, is so this uh, was quite a big hailstorm that trashed uh, or destroyed, should I say, a vast number of houses within Barara. And uh, at the time, I had a tiled roof, an old terracotta tiled roof. So I'll play the video now to see so you can see how much water was coming through. So as, as you can see, it's uh, really quite a lot of water. So anywhere where there was a perforation in the roof, uh, water was coming through. Now, it, uh, about 30% of my roof was damaged and most of it was coming from the, um, it was Western side, I think. And uh, I'll be advised since then, I didn't know at the time uh, that it's probably best to turn the power off at the, at the, uh, at the, at the switches, at the uh, fuse box, because you don't want to be having live electricity and water don't mix. And I think I was a bit amazed by the, by the situation there that I wasn't actually thinking very clearly. So um, you can learn from my experience and uh, turn the power off until, the, until a electrician make, can uh, give you the okay to turn things back on again. So uh, Jenny, should I talk a bit more about the damage to the house? Yeah, sure. Sure, okay. So in the immediate aftermath of the, of the, uh, of the uh, storm, um, I'll give you also a bit of a brief rundown of how the storm actually hit. It, uh, it came in on, uh, on the afternoon, late afternoon, and it was mostly a dry storm. Uh, the hail came down and pulverized the roof. And uh, by the time we got home, uh, we were able to um, gather some tarpaulins. However, I wasn't able to put the tarpaulins on the roof in time uh, before the rain came. And the rain came uh, down quite heavily, very similar to what we experienced during the past uh, East Coast lows that had torrential rainfall. In fact, the rainfall was so heavy that it was actually dangerous to, dangerous to, to, to drive. In fact, I was on the way back from a friend's place with, with these tarpaulins when the rain hit. And um, I had to stop actually uh, driving because I literally could not see where I was going. And um, there was solid water on the windscreen, uh, the kind of almost greenish color water. It was that heavy. So, um, and this is again uh, what I did in the immediate aftermath, but I would not recommend it. I would highly recommend uh, uh, leaving this kind of work to the SES. Um, now, uh, getting on the roof can be very dangerous. You can slip in a tile, they're wet, they're moldy, they have got uh, lichen on it. Uh, the tiles can slip out from underneath you. Hairline cracks can hide broken tiles and you can fall through that, cut your leg. Um, and there's some pretty significant arteries in your leg as well. So you don't want to be cutting those. And, uh, and you can always fall from the ladder. So um, I can just say I was lucky in this regard that nothing bad happened, but I uh, highly recommend you don't get on the roof. Leave that to the professionals. Um, now, these series of photographs just show you the time scale which you need to, which you need to be prepared for. Uh, now, if you're lucky during the storm, you might get response fairly quickly. The storm could be very localized and the number of houses damaged could be quite small. In that situation, you might be able to get uh, some assistance from the SES or RFS or from the insurance company pretty quickly. However, due to the scale of the disaster, um, you cannot expect to get help very quickly. So the image on your left is three days after the storm hit. Um, and then the image on your bottom right is 16 days after the storm hit. And so yes, I, we had to go through quite a long period of not having a, a watertight roof. And um, so, you need to be prepared for that, is essentially what I'm saying. It, uh, prepared to, to be without any assistance for quite a long time. And, uh, and that can be quite tricky, especially if, you've had, if you have a damaged roof and you have water coming through. Um, it might be worthwhile having a, some tradesmen on, on call, which you can rely on to kind of help you out in the time of need. Um, and this image here on the top left is, a, is an aerial view, aerial view 
of the uh, that shows the number of houses that were damaged during the storm. And then uh, the bottom left is a, uh, an image shared by the RFS. They had helicopters go around the suburb, spotting and counting the number of roofs that were damaged. And as you can see, it pretty much covers most of the suburb of Barara. Uh, it was very localized. It mostly hit Barara Heights. Uh, in fact, the area around in the bottom left of the image, around the train station, was relatively lightly hit. Very, uh, uh, in fact, I had a uh, colleagues living in, Cal in um, Mount Karingai, and they didn't get an ounce of rain or hailstorm, hail hailstones. So it was a very localized, intense storm, and it, it devastated a very tight, a very small geographic area. Okay, so now this is a photograph that was on the Barara Community Facebook page. Um, now, this does not, this is, this image here is really just to show, uh, you know, no waste that can be generated. And this is a, quite a small pile of waste. I'm sure during the recent storms uh, and floods, um, this pile of waste will be, is quite small compared to the ones we've seen recently. However, I'm showing you this image now just to give you an idea that um, asbestos is an issue. And in, in fact, many uh, households in the Barara area had no idea that uh, their houses contained asbestos. Um, our house itself contained um, ceilings and walls were all asbestos, including the laundry and bathroom. So uh, a lot of builders didn't believe that we had asbestos everywhere. Uh, we had checked twice to be sure, and yet still builders didn't, didn't believe us. So there is a risk that if you do suffer a storm and you get um, a lot of storm damage, uh, make sure you know what it is that you're working with first before you start ripping things out. In fact, I did hear, hear about one household in Barara that had to throw away the entire contents of their house because of the contamination from asbestos throughout all their belongings. So uh, it's, if you don't know whether or not you have asbestos in the ceilings and walls, it's definitely worthwhile uh, having it tested ahead of time so that you know what you're dealing with. Yeah, okay. Thanks, James. Um, the next type of storm we're moving on to is the microburst. Now, these are the ones that I explained earlier are a sudden and rapid downward force of wind. You can see from this image, this particular downburst happened out at sea, but they equally occur over land. And you can see how it's fairly localised. There are quite well-defined edges. But when you get the wind hitting the ground, or in this case, the ocean, you see it blasting out to the side. And that wind can be quite um, uh, phenomenal speed. So you get a lot of destruction occurring from that um, out explosive outburst uh, of the air. So these microbursts happen not infrequently. We, we probably see at least one every summer, um, but depending on where they hit, uh, you may or may not hear about the destruction. So just moving on. So this is a video taken out of the window of a microburst event. Sorry, 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 Jenny, I jumped it. I jumped the gun there. Sorry. So you can see the wind traveling across the ground, the horizontal to the ground. It was very handy. This particular microburst happened uh, at council chambers. So we were able to film the event. These are incredibly destructive storms, as you'll see. A whole lot of timber coming down. And that will show you the aftermath of that particular event. So uh, transport corridors get interfered with quite often. And this particular image is of the outside of the council chambers where a tree branch went through a window, landed on a fellow's desk. Uh, fortunately, he wasn't there in the office at the time, 
and the door was shut into the office and the pressure differential was so great when the window burst in that it blew the door off its hinges and the internal door. So that just gives you an idea of the sort of uh, destruction that can occur with these, as well as the next image. Well, I think you have to go back one, James. I think you skipped one. I did. Oh, sorry. So this is this is the kind of uh, destruction that occurred from that particular microburst that we were filming. You can see it brought down uh, again a huge amount of timber and quite substantial trees. So, and these were very healthy trees with no indication that they would be likely to come down. So moving on, the next thing we're gonna look at is um, blackout generated by storms. And just show you how one event can lead to wide scale blackouts. James, would you like to talk about this one? Um, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, what we'll show you first is a, a video. Uh, a, uh, basically what it is, is the Bureau of Meteorology's um, rain radar that captured the storm. Now, again, this should bring back some memories, uh, some recent memories due to the length of the video. It starts off um, on the 6th of February, 2020. And this was an East Coast low that actually put out the Black Summer bushfires uh, that devastated uh, large areas of New South Wales and Queensland and Victoria. So again, uh, we were coming out of a drought and uh, the, I think the Warragamba was down to 40%, or maybe even less. And this rain event filled it up to four, close to, yeah, 100%, about 93 or something like that. So this rain event lasted just three days. Uh, not as long, actually, as the one we, we experienced recently. I think it was almost two weeks worth of rain. And uh, what, the, what, what, what makes this storm different to the one we just experienced was the, the winds that came along with it. It was very damaging, and it caused a lot of trees to fall down. The ground was sodden, so the trees uh, were, uh, the root bases were, were able to, to, to lift up off, off the soil and come down and damaged power lines and other bits of infrastructure, damaged houses and damaged cars and the like. Here you're seeing uh, on the uh, ninth is when it really picked up, when the rainfall really came down very heavily. And along with this heavy rainfall was, like I mentioned, the high winds that caused a lot of destruction. So that's pretty much about it. So now we'll look at the uh, aftermath of that storm. Here you see is, um, is what we normally use for the bushfire workshop. It's called a sim table, but we can use the sim table, table to also show the uh, uh, other kinds of storm damage and not just bushfire. So what I'll show you first is what happened to uh, people who had damage done to the, to the private uh, power lines. And as you can see here, this is Karingai, and you can see that quite a lot of properties in the Karingai area suffered blackouts. Now, these are all individual properties. The colors indicate uh, the duration of blackouts. So the area of uh, the yellow blocks uh, show you the, the properties that had a blackout for just one day. Uh, the red blocks indicate properties that had blackouts for up to two weeks. And the colors in between, such as orange, are somewhere like one week worth of blackout. So these are what these, these, these householders had to deal with. Um, and uh, they had to use make quite, a, quite significant changes in their life uh, during this period. So what I'll do now is I'll turn this layer off and show you another layer, which is the, um, it, which is, uh, shows you the kind of number of properties that suffered blackouts due to damage to Osgrid's infrastructure, namely power lines on the street. So here you can see a lot more people suffered blackouts. Whole, whole areas or suburbs were without power for quite a long period of time. Um, uh, there are areas that only had a blackout for one day, uh, as you can see by the yellow colors, but then uh, quite a few number of properties had blackouts for um, uh, a week, for up, up to a week, and a few even had it longer, close to two weeks there. So when you combine that alongside it, everyone else that had a, a blackout, 
or the individual ones, you can see you know, a vast majority of Korean guys suffer from some form of blackouts. Now, if you cast your mind back to that time, I think people had to have showers in the, uh, the only way people could get hot showers was to go to the showground, I believe. And there were, they were uh, power generators on people on street corners to help power the traffic lights so the Pacific Highway could, 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 could operate. So, um, yeah, so, so when, come, so when you start planning for storm events, you need to consider not just the damage being done and how you're going to get help, but also how long you might be waiting for help and what you might need to do. So you might need to plan for, um, um, you know, extended periods of that power. Jenny, you're on mute. So I am. Okay, so moving on. Would you like to show the Climate Community's website? Uh, we've got the other two storms first. Yeah. Okay. We can um, go back in time and uh, look at the hell storm, which is this one here. So this is a hell storm. This, uh, as we mentioned, we should have shown you this earlier, but it's a very, it was a very intense storm. And I think that was the storm there, the black blob there that came through. Oh no, sorry, I'm, that's a bit early. Actually, it was on the 20th of December. So the next storm, the next day, we're in the 19th. Now it's the 20th. And on the bottom left of the screen, you can see uh, the time ticking over. So we're, we're still in the morning, so nothing much happens. It was genuinely a, a clear day. It was fairly mild, fairly humid. But then uh, as usual, storms happen in the afternoon. And that was a storm that damaged, uh, that, that pummeled uh, Barara. It's all black, it's all pretty heavy there. And then, so that happened at 5 p.m. And then I think the second one coming through was at 7 p.m. And uh, that did all the damage in terms of all the water coming through. So it was like a military operation. You know, the artillery that came through and blasted everyone's roots. And then you had uh, uh, another wave of, of artillery coming through and pouring the water through everyone's roofs and through the holes there. So that was what that was like. It was very quick, very sudden. And one thing that did stand out to me as I got out of the train station to Barara to see the damage around the area is that it was a scene of utter, of utter devastation, but it smelled lovely. All the eucalypts and tea trees were, were quite uh, aromatic because they'd been, I think, turned into pumice for um, the poultice. Anyway, uh, the next storm here we'll <laughs> show you is the uh, microburst. So now um, I'll get everyone to pay attention to the middle dot, which is Pimble, down there. And I think it happened on the, oh, it was 19th, yes, around right about now, I think. Or maybe there's another storm, I know it's been a while. It happens very quickly and you have to pay quite a bit of attention because even though the amount of the storm that hits is very small, but it was very intense. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong storm. Here it is. There it is there, I think. Yeah, it's a blink and you miss it. Mm -hmm. So what you can see from the footprint of these storms is exactly what um, Dick Whitaker has said. Where they're coming from is uh, either the southwest or the northwest, except for the east coast line, which comes in off the ocean. In fact, um, I have to make a little correction. This is the moment the hells of the storm hit Pimple. As you can see, that black blob is coming just across the, the square that represents Pimble. And it happened at around about, say, 12.48. And I was just finishing my lunch outside and I was able to duck inside the council chambers before the storm hit. And literally within, within five seconds of me leave, entering the building, the storm hit and trees started falling down. So the, 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 I, you know, it was very, very dangerous had I been a little bit late or caught out on the street, um, as I think a number, a number of people were, it, they could have been hurt, hurt by falling debris. So. So you can see with these kinds of events that it's not just one area that gets hammered. 
There are a whole range of areas uh, suffering impacts at the same time. And that's part of the reason why the SES may not be able to get to you for a day, even two days. And uh, as the people up in the Northern Rivers were um, quite rightly distressed that nobody came to help them, that's the sort of thing we've got to plan for. What do you do if nobody comes to help? And it's about communities learning to help themselves largely. And that's a program that council is developing at the moment, uh, more about communities working together collectively to be able to respond to these events in, in a recovery situation, but also in the preparation. So that's for a future, future workshop. But for now, we'll go and look at climate-wise communities because this will help you focus your mind on your property and, uh, and what you can do uh, to prepare yourselves for these kinds of events and um, how you can make your property more resilient and how you might connect with your neighbours uh, when recovery uh, or you need some help in preparation. So <clears throat> the climate-wise communities is uh, set into five steps and it's called the get ready check. So are you ready? And you just press yes and agree that you won't sue council if uh, your house blows down. And the first thing you get to do is map your location. So we type in an address into the website. And this address will bring up an outline of your property and give you an idea of the sorts of issues that your pro property is subjected to. So we've just typed in a random um, address and it'll clarify as the internet speed picks up. And what you'll see is a number of different colors that go across this property. Now the red is bushfire prone land. The yellow is ember attack. The blue is flood prone. So you'll see if we scroll down a little bit that this property has most issues except exit issues, which means it has multiple ways in and out. So if they need to evacuate, they have choices available to them. Now there's a lot of properties in Karingai where they don't have choices available to them because there is only one road in and out. And that takes special consideration when you're doing your uh, bushfire or storm um, plan. So this particular one, it is uh, subject to bushfire. It's also uh, got uh, ember attack. It's um, flood prone. Uh, and every property in Karingai will come up as being subject to storm and to heat. So that's just a, a universal risk across every LGA. So that's step one. Step two looks at your personal situation. So I just click on step two and we'll scroll down and you'll see that there are a number of uh, questions for you to answer. And those questions give you a bit of a feel of how well prepared you and your household is. Can you scroll down a bit more, James, please? So <clears throat> it asks you, do you live alone or with others? And I should mention, by the way, that this data, once you step out of a step, that data, unless you save it as a PDF to your computer, which is an option at the bottom of every page, that data is lost because council doesn't want to know your um, personal circumstances. This is for you and you alone or you and your family. So looks at the people in your household, uh, James, any chance of making it any larger? That's great. Yep, thanks. So um, whether there are children, elderly, and you click on the box that's relevant and it will give you a hint about some of the things you need to think about um, in your planning uh, about what are you going to do with elderly people how are they going to cope? 
um, and how are you going to evacuate them, etc. So it gives you a lot of hints about what you might need to think about in the plan. The same as if you're a carer or if there are people in the household with health and medical conditions. And if there are pets in the household. Now, you would have seen uh, on the footage of the, uh, the floods up in Lismore and uh, the Hawkesbury, <clears throat> a lot of people evacuating at the last second with their, their dogs clutched to their chest or, or swimming along beside them. So <clears throat> in the Lismore instance, that was an extraordinary flood. And you could be forgiven for saying people would not have been prepared for that kind of an event because it was so sudden and so extreme. So uh, in general though, with particularly with uh, flood prone land, you do have a bit more time, you get a bit of warning and uh, you can make sure you can get your animals out. Now that takes a bit of planning because animals when there's a lot of stress around will hide uh, or they won't let you catch them. So you've got to think about how you're going to uh, handle that sort of situation should it occur. You've got to think about whether you've got your own transport waiting at your door or whether you're going to have to organise for someone to come and help you uh, get out or, or get your pet out. And uh, what are you going to do if you're not at home? So <clears throat> say a storm hits and um, you have the kids at home alone, uh, how are they going to cope? How are you going to get back to them? because quite often with power lines down and roads are, uh, are blocked, you can't get back to them. So that needs to be part of your planning. Whether there's a, an English proficiency in the household, now your household might be proficient in English, but are your neighbours? And if your neighbours are not, then it's a good idea to work through this with them so they understand the situation uh, should something happen Instead of when you're about to leave, as has often happened, your neighbour coming across and saying, what's going on, what's happening? Home ownership gives you a lot more opportunities to be able to modify your home to make it more resilient. But if you're a renter or a boarder, then that comes with a bit of negotiation. But it also may mean that you want to uh, increase your personal insurance to cover any losses if the um, owner of the home won't improve its resilience. Our mobile phone connections, of course, when the power goes down, we don't have um, a landline anymore. Sorry, we don't have, yeah, we don't have the landline because it goes through NBN and we don't have the computer. So a lot of the time, all the emergency messaging will come through uh, the ABC in Sydney 702. They're the emergency broadcasters. So you would need to have a radio, either your car radio or a battery radio in the house to be able to listen to what's going on and give you the heads up as to how you might be able to get out and uh, where you might be able to get assistance. Uh, the other thing that happens in these severe storms, of course, is the mobile phone towers can come down and uh, you also you lose your mobile phone signal. So that radio can become a, a pretty precious lifeline. So again, in this step two, you save it to your PDF. And then we move on to the big step. And this is the one that looks at your property. Now, as I said, we don't just look at um, um, storm. We also look at bushfire and heat and drought resilience. Uh, as I said, because there are common factors. Uh, to each one of these disaster types. For example, communication is common to each disaster type. Some people like to draw a mud map of their property and, and look at the features that are strengths and weaknesses. So if you've got trees overhanging your roof, that might be a weakness and your plan might be to get an arborist out to assess that tree. And sometimes they take a few of the heavy limbs out, which allows the wind to pass through the tree more easily and there's less likelihood of the tree blowing over. So you look at different features of your house. Now to get a very detailed look, we scroll down and you can see what we're interested in tonight is storm. So again, click on storm. 
I think that's Pushpa again. James is very used to clicking on Bushbar. Yeah, so sorry, 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 Jane. That's muscle memory. Speaking. <laughs> so um, we look at the kind of roofing material that you have and its age, because that can uh, be a, a real weakness, as James pointed out, with the old tiles. The old terracotta tiles get very brittle as they age. And so if you get a hailstorm, uh, they can impact and smash those tiles relatively easily. But if you have a, a collar bond a metal roof, for example, uh, that can be much more resilient. And also the shape of the roof. Now, something we haven't put in there, but which has uh, often become an issue, is the distance of how far the roof goes out uh, over the wall, the external wall. So a lot of modern houses, they don't have much um, of an overhang. And so what happens when the gutters back up, the water pours down the wall cavity. So it's always something to think about if you're going to redesign your roof to give yourself that bit of distance from the wall so that the gutters, if they do overflow, just free fall through the air rather than into your wall. So again, when you click on each one, it will give you a little bit of information about that particular aspect. Um, the roof to wall connection method. So how the roofs and the walls and also how the roof is tied down um, to the structure. Now, a lot of the older houses, would you believe some roofs are just sitting on the walls. They're not tied down at all. So knowing whether or not that roof is secured to pieces of the, um, infrastructure that go into the ground is quite uh, necessary, particularly for those strong winds. Um, again, we look at the state of the gutters and the downpipes. That's a fairly obvious one. Now, as you can see, it's all color coded. So if it comes up red, that means it's a weakness. If it comes up green, it means it's much more resilient and less likely to fail. So we go on down through skylights and solar panels. And uh, then we look in some detail at the walls and the material that they're made from and the seals around the doors and the windows. We look at the garage door because it can be, particularly if you live down a hill a little bit and uh, you've got a small drain outside your garage door, uh, that can often, if you don't keep it well maintained, fill with debris and overtop very easily in a storm and so flood your garage. Now, if there's any way to seal your garage, some people have a bit of a lip. So getting into the garage, there's just a small step that you drive over and into the garage and that helps, uh, gives you a bit more buffering to keep the water out. We look at the outdoors, we look at the landscaping particularly the drainage and where it drains to. Uh, not only have you got to think with these, these new types of rain events that we're having now with climate change, we've got to think whether or not our drains have the capacity to deal with some of these high flows that happen when we get these um, phenomenal rain, like what was it, the peak of the last uh, storm that we had, it was uh, averaging 200 millimetres a day for several days. So you've got to think, can your drainage cope with that? Uh, we look at outdoor sheds, <clears throat> just because they need to be kept secure as well. Uh, wind and sheds can um, take off in storms. Uh, and surprisingly, so can water tanks if they don't have much water in them. So think about whether or not your water tank is secured, or at least it gets a certain amount of water left in it to keep it weighed down. Outdoor furniture and items. So generally you've got to bring them inside. So you've got to have room to put them inside or at least on the lee side, the side opposite to where the storm is coming from. So the plumage and drain systems, we've, we've spoken about that. And uh, a strong room for sheltering during the storm. Now I heard on the news tonight, a lady talking about uh, a tornado in the US in a, hitting a school. 
And uh, where they sheltered was in the hallways because uh, it, the structure was built that the hallways were the shelter in uh, strongest place to shelter. Often it is the smaller rooms that are the strongest place. So think about where in your house might be the strongest place. You don't want to be near windows. And um, if there are external doors, you uh, want to be very sure that that door uh, is well secured. Uh, pets in enclosure, of course, they need to, to also survive the storm. So how are you looking after them if they're, they're outdoor animals? And uh, that gives you a few ideas about the sorts of things you need to consider. And you'll see also in a lot of these, there's a, a link where you can get further information about each one of these uh, choices. Uh, the electrical meter box needs to be accessible. And um, if it's in an exposed location and open to the elements, it needs to be protected. Uh, watertight service panels should be and located in a protected area. So you also got to make sure, and they normally are up high enough that if a flood occurs, you're not going to uh, or get electrocuted in the first half hour of the flood. So <clears throat> again, you save that to the PDF and that gives you a whole lot of information about what you might need to do about your house in order to make it more resilient to storms and uh, the types of materials, if you're going to do some retrofitting, spend some money on your property, uh, how you might uh, uh, make it more resilient. Uh, for example, looking at windows, you might choose uh, double glazing windows or, or you might choose um, um, a metal roof over a tile roof, for example. Okay, this next step that we look at, step four, is just about connecting with your neighbours and uh, how you might work together. And a part of this is about if you're going to leave your property and evacuate, who do you tell where you're going? And do you know already where you're going to go to? So you need to have that exit route plan. And remember the situation can change very quickly. You might have an exit route plan, but the tree comes down over the power line and that's no longer a viable exit. So you, if you live in a, a road, which is just one road in, one road out, and you can't get out, you may not be able to get out for some days. So do you have uh, enough food? Do you have um, enough medication to last you at least 72 hours? And that's at least 72 hours uh, so that you don't have to, uh, to get help from elsewhere. Now, also in the local neighbourhood, you might have people who have resources that uh, can be called upon in the event of emergency. For example, someone might um, be skilled in using a chainsaw and has a chainsaw, and they might be able to um, do some preliminary work, at least to enable people to be able to be more mobile. Um, so there's a whole range of different skills that are often available in neighbourhoods that people can utilise. In country areas, that's a really big um, positive because they often do have heavy machinery and uh, heavy equipment, et cetera, so that they can bring on at a moment's notice and help their neighbours. Not quite so much in the urban areas, but we still do have people that have some good gear with them. Uh, it also might be that you need someone to uh, help you get out and um, they can uh, assist you in doing that. I know with our neighbours, we've lost power a couple of times and they happen to be on a different grid to us. So they've allowed us to run a, um, a power cord across from their place to ours to at least allow us to have a couple of lights and to keep the fridge going. So, um, you know, if you've got nice neighbours like that, that's always handy. You might want to find out too if you've got elderly neighbours or, or people who are new to the area, uh, if they require assistance. So exchanging those details and getting to know people in the local area has a lot of benefits. Okay, just scrolling on down. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we, we talk about pets again because pets have featured uh, very significantly during a lot of these disasters. 
and people taking extraordinary risks to try and save their animals. Um, so we're trying to avoid the situation where people have to take extraordinary risks. So let's say your neighbours have a dog in their backyard and uh, they're away at work and uh, the area's got to evacuate. Uh, is it possible that uh, you might be able to take the dog out for them uh, if they can't get back in? So those little cooperative um, situations uh, are really the, the mesh that makes up a good, well-prepared community. Okay, so I'll give you a few other things to think about down there. Um, also about where you get information from extreme, about extreme weather events. You've got the SES website is generally very good. Um, the Bureau of uh, Meteorology is another good one. Um, and the um, Resilience New South Wales network they don't tend to have emergency information, but they do have a lot of follow-up information, as does Red Cross and, uh, and Council as well. So they're all uh, worthwhile sources to get in contact with if you are in that situation. So <clears throat> just finishing off down there, again, that's uh, something that you can save to a PDF for your planning purposes. And then we give you a, a few little um, links to some useful uh, information, like the Red Cross, um, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, landline with NBN blackouts. They can, you can see uh, which areas have been blacked out. Uh, because if it's you, you won't be able to see it. So if you might have friends and relatives that you want to find out about. You can get emergency alerts over the telephone. I don't know anyone who's tried that, but um, I think it, it's still operational. You should test that, James, and see if it still works. And, of course, the Red Cross have the Get Prepared app, which is something that you can use all this information and use their app as the planning tool. Also, the RFS, if you're looking at fire, is a, a useful one. Um, and there is on the Red Cross one specifically for carers. Uh, so if you're a carer and you want a plan that's useful to your circumstance, uh, have a look at the Red Cross website. So the last thing we do on this particular uh, website is step five, and it is uh, something that came out of the Black Saturday fires. So you've got all the information for your plan. So again, I'm just repeating, if you've got a bushfire plan, there's RFS, Storms, SES, Heat Waves, Red Cross, and then there's a Care Australia's link. So just moving on to the what if tool. The what if tool for storms. So this what if tool came out of Black Saturday. And it was because the number of people in the research showed who had bushfire survival plans, and that was less than 5% of the people impacted actually had a plan. Nearly always they didn't work. Almost universally they said it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was because the event didn't happen the way they thought it was going to happen. And they only had one plan. And they had no contingencies built into that plan. So if the bushfire didn't go exactly as they thought it would, or in this case, if the storm doesn't go exactly as you think it should, then what are you going to do? How are you are going to adapt? You've got to be nimble and, and be able to make quick decisions about alternatives. So what this does is it gives you some of the things that commonly happen in uh, storms that may throw your plan out the window. And so you can look at what contingency could you put in place. So if you pre-think these out, it's going to be a lot easier for you on the day if you need to use them. Whereas if you're trying to think up an alternative on the day, you know, your brain is uh, under a lot of stress and that's when it's not good at thinking up alternatives. So we'll just have a little, this is like a chocolate wheel. 
and it'll randomly stop on one of these choices. And this one says your electricity fails. So what do you do if the electricity fails? Whether that be communication, whether that be refrigeration, uh, whether it be light, cooking, etc. What are you going to do with no electricity? And again, if you think about it for what are you going to do for 72 hours, then that's on an average you'll probably um, be able to cope. In a very extreme event, it will be longer, but most uh, times you're not having electricity outages more than 72 hours. As we saw from that map that James showed us, that does in fact occur, but not that frequently and not to that many people. So we'll just do another one. We'll just press the button again. <clears throat> See another one that comes up. So you can press the button all day to your heart's desire when you get on here. Your pet's missing. So if you're about to get out of there, um, because you'd say after the storm, you've got no power, there's been damage to the house. And so your plan is to evacuate to a relative's place. But all of a sudden you can't find your cat or your dog. Um, there's a lot of people who refuse to leave without finding that family member and taking them with you. So in storms, it's quite difficult because you often don't get much warning. In a, in a, in a bushfire or a flood, there's often a little bit more warning and you can get the animal um, and capture it and uh, put it in a secure place, ready to leave uh, should the need arise. So uh, storms, if uh, you've got a very super sensitive cat, then uh, it would be wise to put them somewhere secure just in case that storm hits your area. Um, at some point, we will be expanding this to address things like earthquake and uh, other disaster types. And that's a really important one in earthquakes because animals detect earthquakes long before we do, up to 60 seconds before we do. So they can get quite agitated. Uh, because they can feel the alpha waves coming through and usually in their paws. But that's a story for another day. Okay, James, where have we got left? Um, we also have the Ask an Expert as well, a uh, function of the website. So if, if there's anything we didn't quite cover here or you have questions about what we did discuss, you can always just um, go to um, the Ask an Expert part of the website, which is under additional info, and is the first at the top of the list there. And uh, here you can ask a question. Uh, so if you scroll down, put your name, postcode, email, and then your question. That question will come to me, and I'll uh, do my best to answer that question. If it's a fairly general one, I can, I can give you an answer. If it's more technical, I will get someone from perhaps the SES, or other uh, qualified persons to ask that question for you. We have a network of experts all around um, Australia that are experts in all, all manner of things, architects through to engineers and, um, and, uh, and uh, of course, the SES. So feel free to ask to put those questions there and uh, I'll do my best to get them through to you. Um, now, we can always uh, discuss extra events. Uh, well, we can talk about rebates that are available to people. Um, to help them become a bit more resilient. We don't have any storm related uh, rebates. However, the WaterSmart rebate program uh, can, be, uh, can be used in a roundabout way to help you become a bit more resilient to high rainfall events. Some people around the Karingai have problems with stormwater on their property. Um, for example, uh, they might have a neighbor that has water coming off their land into yours, or perhaps the location of your house means that you you can get a lot of water flowing into areas where you don't want it to flow it might be causing issues with your foundations or it could be making your garden very soggy and, and unusable or you might have water pooling there so the water smart rebate uh, can help you with that it can help you um, with up to a thousand dollars to go towards say uh, rainscaping 
Now, rainscaping is a way of modifying your garden so that it can uh, absorb more water and redirect water away from problem areas and into others where it can be naturally absorbed by the soil instead of sending the water into the stormwater system, which then causes um, a large amount of erosion problems. Um, the water smart rebate can also be used for re uh, rain gardens. Rain gardens are, the, are a way of taking the stormwater and filtering that water through a garden bed before it's released slowly into the stormwater system. Um, and uh, it, rain gardens are also good at actually cleaning the water up as well. So you reduce the water pollution issues there. But most popular, most popular option is to use the rain water spot rebate to install a rainwater tank. Um, so um, these rainwater tanks are very handy. It's very popular. It can be useful for capturing that stormwater uh, and stopping it from flowing down into the stormwater system. And it can be useful for having uh, water during a drought as well, making your, your garden a bit more um, resilient to, to extreme heat and droughts, as well as maybe um, if you can have a large enough rainwater tank, you can use that for uh, bushfire protection as well. So uh, we have other, um, well, uh, we have other uh, events coming up in, in the next week. We have a, um, a, a bushfire workshop on the 30th of March. That one is for the uh, residents residents living in the North Warringah area. So if you know anyone or if yourself live in North Warringah, we highly recommend you jump online and watch that one. It's a, it should be very good and we will be simulating a bushfire in the North Warringah area and it will show you how it could um, how it could occur and the damage it could be, be doing to people's homes. Um, now if you don't live in that area, uh, you can still uh, register, you can still join. Um, but it, uh, it will focus mostly on the North Warringah area. Oh, uh, yeah. So, it, Jenny, is there anything else you'd like, you'd like to add to that? Uh, I probably should mention, normally with these um, storm workshops, we have the SES in attendance with us, and they're not here tonight for probably very obvious reasons, but they're still cleaning up after that storm uh, the last couple of weeks. So um, uh, normally they would be here, um, and... Um, we really appreciate their attendance, but for obvious reasons, they couldn't be here tonight. I think that's the only thing I didn't mention. Okay, great. Does anyone have, have any questions they'd like to ask us now? Uh, if you have questions, please put them into the uh, Q&A box. Uh, well, maybe, Jenny, we can also uh, perhaps, because uh, we could also maybe uh, turn the microphones on for the participants as well, if they want to have a conversation about storms. Sure. Um, so I think uh, Nick, Linda, and Joe, um, you're allowed. You can you can talk if you like. If you, if you have a question you'd like to ask, if not, uh, if you can feel free to put the questions you have into the Q and A box. If no one has any questions, we can always um, call it uh, call call it an evening, and. Um, it would be lovely to see you at a following bushfire workshop as well. So, Joe, do you have a question? No? Okay. Oh, um, Jenny, I think we might be able to leave you here. Uh, no one has any questions. And uh, we'll leave you all to enjoy your evening. And um, good luck. And let's hope there's no East Coast lows this winter because i think everyone is a bit fed up with these curse loads yeah yeah oh yeah. I, actually i do have one extra thing i need to mention uh and i'm sure everyone might, might be experiencing it right now is mold actually that's one of the surprising impacts of uh, storm season or needs or needs to slow um if you have reverse cycle air conditioners it, it does have a, a dry mode uh we use that during the two weeks or so of constant rain and we were able to avoid the worst of the mold situations. I think, uh, judging by what's being shared online or on newspapers, other people have suffered really badly with a lot of, with a lot of mold. So, uh, find that function on your air conditioner and make use of it. Now you tell me, Joan. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, thanks everyone for your attendance, and uh, we hope you got something out of it. Yep, and uh, make that emergency kit. It could be very useful. All right. All the okay. best. Stay safe. Come on. Okay, bye.